Welcome, everyone, to the NCAA Social Series, episode 47. I'm Andy Katz. Shortly, I'll be joined by Dr. Brian Hainlein, the NCAA Chief Medical Officer, and then shortly thereafter, Dr. Leon McDougall, the Chief Diversity Officer from the Ohio State Wexler Medical Center, also the President of the National Medical Association and a member of the Medical Advisory Group. Vaccines are here, Dr. Hainline, but first, before we get to the vaccine, I just want to get sort of a general overview from you uh, because we're almost there. We are in the final two weeks of the regular season for men's and women's basketball. We've got conference tournaments coming up and then selection Sunday for the men on the 14th, the women on the 15th, uh, everything in the state of Indiana for the men, everything in the state of Texas for the women. Um, we're almost there. We almost got there. So how would you assess where we are right now in dealing with the pandemic almost at that line to cross and get into the postseason? Well, Andy, you put things in perspective. And, uh, you, you know, I remember a year ago, we just were so deeply disappointed with everything that had unfolded. And, and you know, and, and we acted in a responsible manner. And, and right now we're, we're, you know, really uplifted because even though the pandemic is still raging on in, in, in many ways, but the, the numbers are moving in the right direction, but we understand it so much better. And working with our uh, medical advisory group and collaborating with the membership and other scientists, we really have been able to take our time and put together a thoughtful plan. So, so we're actually ready. You know, we, we spent a couple hours doing tabletops today and um, we're, we're feeling really good, you know, both in Marion County and, and, and Indiana and, and Bear County in Texas. Uh, we're, we're, we think it's going to be a, a great championship. Won't be like, you know, before with full house, but it's still going to be great. So a couple things on that. Um, the fact that all these teams, both men and women, have had to deal with strict protocols to get to this point. Uh, obviously, a number of them have had to deal with quarantining. But the fact that they've dealt with the masking, they're used to it now eating by themselves potentially, or at least eating, you know, six feet apart, all these things that are going to have to happen in Indiana and in Texas. How much do you think that has prepared these student athletes, the coaches and the officials to get to this point? Oh, it makes a huge difference, Andy. I mean, we can test them. I mean, we could test people five, five times a day, but if you don't modify behavior, you won't get a handle on this pandemic unless you have eradication of the virus or widespread herd immunity. And we, we don't have either of those. So, so the behavior is key. And so in, in both tournaments, there's gonna to be a controlled environment. And in that controlled environment where the tier one individuals are, the players, coaches, the travel party, essentially, they will always be physically distanced and masked. In fact, the only time they won't have a mask on is either when they're in their hotel room alone or when they're in the pre-approved eating areas, which are physically distanced, or when they're actually on the court competing or practicing, even on the bench, they're gonna be wearing a mask and distance. So, so the behavior has become second nature. And, and I think that's a huge advantage for the championships. So we're gonna talk about vaccines here momentarily. We're gonna bring in Dr. Leon McDougall here momentarily, but before I get to Dr. McDougall, I just wanna ask you another thing that I thought was interesting in, in my daily conversations, it seems, that we never really got on the same page as a country. And, and yet, you know, so many of these schools have had to adapt and they're going to have to adapt in the postseason. For example, uh, Steve Peichel from Rutgers was telling me when he travels in the Big, Big Ten, when they would play in the state of Michigan, they couldn't even meet even in a giant room for film study. Whereas in Iowa, they could actually eat in the same room, you know, distance, but, you know, eat in that. So this adaptive behavior that schools have had to take on depending upon where they've been in the country, uh, how would you view from your vantage point how all these student athletes and coaches and officials have had to deal with all this? Yeah, so that's been the confusing part, right? Because, you know, from state to state, the rules of engagement can vary. Some states are uh, you really had very few restrictions. Others had tight restrictions and, and even conferences, some conferences, you know, when can you return to play after an infection? Some say 17 days, others say, well, you know, it could be as early as, 11 or 12 days. So, uh, but, but I, I think the, what we've tried to do for the championships is, is we're taking a very conservative approach. We've made that very clear to the membership 
So for those that have, you know, been been practicing and training in a very conservative environment, and by conservative, I mean vis-a-vis -vis infection control and so forth, um, they'll they'll be in the best place. For those that haven't, I mean, they're going to have to adapt and, and and do it quickly. You know, it's interesting. Even a code of conduct has been developed around risk mitigation, and so it it simply will not be acceptable for someone to violate the terms of engagement. Um, and you know, for being in a controlled environment, they leave it well then they suffer the consequences. So um, I think everyone really understands that. And, and it's not only for your own health, it's especially for the health of those around you. And, and it's also to carry out an effective tournament. And one last thing that NCA Senior Vice President Dan Gavitt has said is that uh, based on what uh, you guys have all put in place, that there's definitely a, uh, a feeling of comfort, maybe cautious optimism, that if someone were to test positive, it shouldn't necessarily wipe out a whole team. If proper mitigation is going on from what you were just saying. How, how comfortable are you with that, that, you know, if we do have that, it shouldn't have to completely wipe out a team? Yeah, so Danny's right about that. And, and you know, he and his team have just done such exceptional work. And, and we've worked behind the scenes with, with the uh, local public health authorities, especially in for the men in, in, in uh, Marion County, the women in, in, in Bear County. And we laid out all the scenarios. So even as the teams travel, to the NCAA, they'll be in chartered flights, they'll be distance, they'll be masked. So that eliminates even that time in the airplane as a contact trace possibility because everyone will be doing what they need to do. It's when you violate that, that's the problem. So as long as we don't violate that, then there's not a reason to contact trace out an entire team. And what we're doing in addition is that the players during practice and competition are wearing the Conexon devices. And so we can actually then with that do an analysis and see if there has been an accumulation of 15 minutes of close contact over a period of one day. And, and, and both counties, the local public health authorities for the men and women, they have agreed to this type of analysis. So what that means is that you don't just sort of do a knee jerk reaction and say, well, there's a positive on that team, that whole team has to go. So we've really done it in a really scientific manner. And, and, and we think it's, it's uh, gonna be enormously beneficial for you know, the tournament, but more importantly, you, you know, there's no reason to have someone be in quarantine if they don't need to be. So we want to make sure those that need to be in quarantine are there, but you don't want to unnecessarily put someone in quarantine. And now joining us here on the NCAA Social Series episode 47 to continue our conversation, Dr. Leon McDougall, uh, the Chief Diversity Officer from the Ohio State Wexler Medical Center, also from the National Medical Association and a member of the NCAA's Medical Advisory Group. And uh, Dr. McDougall, um, as we are taping, we have the news that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has received the uh, emergency uh, authorization from the FDA. So we now have three in the United States, J&J uh, &J joining Moderna and Pfizer. J&J &J is a one shot, Moderna and Pfizer is a two shot. So just first, before we dive in to a couple issues related to vaccines, um, just your overall thoughts that now we have three potential uh, vaccines that, that are now um, in the marketplace uh, in the coming weeks to help uh, combat the pandemic. Andy, that is a wonderful news. Uh, as a member of the National Medical Association Task Force on Vaccines and Therapeutics, we've met with the scientists from Pfizer, from Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, and we're going to have a follow-up meeting actually with Johnson & Johnson to review that data. Our task force is comprised of infectious disease specialists, infectious disease epidemiologists, public health experts, and uh, we'll then also provide our thoughts concerning safety and effectiveness of the vaccine as it pertains to uh, the Black community, Black doctors looking at this from a lens in service of our community. So far, what we've learned has been very positive. So I want to pick up on that point. Uh, President Biden said that the hope is by the end of the summer, you know, we could have, if, I'm, if my timeline's correct here, 600 million doses, which of course, you know, would take most of the population in the United States. Now, of course, that's doses. They still have to get into the arm and there has to be willing participants. To your point, um, where do we stand on crossing that bridge? Because there is past history of abuse, um, certainly in the black and brown community of feeling 
essentially like guinea pigs in, in the history of this country. So how do you cross that to ensure the efficacy, the safety, and basically a way out or one of the major ways out of this pandemic uh, to, to get the black and brown community to say, look, you need to take this. Well, another good question. And that has called us to have conversations with the black community and having an opportunity to answer questions in town hall forums, also engaging leadership, clergy leadership across the nation, uh, black fraternities and sororities, black professional organizations. This has been the work of the Black Coalition Against COVID comprised of the Consortium of Four Black Medical Schools, the National Urban League, the National Black Nurses Association, the National Medical Association, the Montague Cobb Health Institute, and blackdoctor.org. In fact, with these town halls, we've reached over 260,000 people on, with these convenings. And I would uh, recommend that the audience take a look at the Black Coalition Against COVID webpage and also the National Medical Association released this advisory statement on both the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. So I would encourage the audience to also take a look at those uh, documents and those resources to help provide information that they may be seeking to have more confidence in the vaccines. Uh, Brian, from a student athlete perspective, um, and within the university communities, how can the NCAA help in that regard to break down that stereotype uh, to ensure that black and brown athletes, you know, and coaches and administrators and everyone within the membership, you know, is on board with this? Well, great question, Andy. It's, it's, so it's one more thing that I'll be leaning on Dr. McDougall for to work with the National Medical Association and our Student Athlete Advisory Committee. And, and specifically, you know, there are subgroups of those committees that are for football athletes, for basketball athletes, which, which have a, a, a larger proportion of, of black athletes there. And, and so it, it's a very important discussion. Um, I think the athletes in general, they, they understand COVID because they, they've been really walking through it day to day just so that they can compete. Um, but that would be a wonderful partnership to get, you know, the student athletes in a group like the NMA uh, together to get some really important messaging out. I don't think the difficulty is going to be at the collegiate level, but if you, you see collegiate athletes that are saying, hey, this is really, it's not just for us, it's for the entire community. We have to reach the high school athletes and, and when the vaccine becomes available to those under 16, uh, you know, and beyond. So I think it's going to be a very important messaging that could have a powerful effect. Well, and also, I mean, if people want to get to a new normal or some form of normalcy in the fall of 2122, um, we need to have obviously a higher, higher percentage you when know, that 70%, you know, on board to reach that herd immunity. Um, if I can, before I, uh, Brian, I just want you on this one other topic related to that. And then I want to dive a little deeper with Dr. McDougall historically, but there's going to be fans, small amount, but still a percentage of fans. Uh, that will be at these postseason championships. Um, some may vac be vaccinated, some may not. Some coaches or administrators may be vaccinated by the time we get to these championships. So how do you handle that in terms of a population that where, where we're going to have some vac vaccinated people involved and, and some not? Yeah, so what we decided, and, and this again was working with uh, public health authorities, the CDC um, in our medical advisor group, so we are not going to change the, the, the cadence of testing if you're vaccinated or not. It started to get too complicated because it can vary from municipality to municipality. And that potentially sends a mixed message, Andy, right? That, well, you know, you have a vaccine, you still have to be tested. What good is the vaccine? And so we aren't saying that. We, we're, we, we just aren't 100% certain yet about, you know, the ability to transmit the virus after you're inoculated, even if the vaccine is highly effective. So the, the real message is that these vaccines are really effective. I mean, they are essentially preventing death and, and hospitalization in a way that most vaccines don't. Um, but, but just for the practical purposes with the tournament just around the corner, we aren't changing the cadence of testing recommendations. So to that point, Dr. McDougall, um, messaging is huge here. And it has been the case certainly 
uh, with the pandemic. Uh, and I think Dr. Hanlon makes a great point in that, uh, you know, you have to diffuse that myth of saying, well, you know, if I still have to do everything, why should I get vaccinated? Well, it actually may not prevent, you know, I guess there's a small percentage you potentially could maybe get it, but death, big deal, and serious illness and hospitalization, major deal. How do you get that message out that you need to get vaccinated to prevent the big things uh, and not worry about, you know, potentially a, a small infection if you were to get infected? Well, uh, Andy, another great question. So uh, taking the pivot and, and just assuming that one may have a small infection, that's not necessarily so. Uh, we've seen uh, younger people have serious uh, uh, ailments and disease related to COVID-19 infections. So getting that vaccine or the series of vaccines, two of them, not only will help to protect the athletes, student athletes' life and well-being, but their friends and families. And so that's why groups such as the National Medical Association and the Black Coalition Against COVID, we're providing oversight, also uh, providing information that's understandable in a conversational way with our community. So help educate our public here. Uh, I'm curious, how often in your practice or in your lifetime have you come across, um, you know, people who have said, you know what, I know the history of this. Uh, we've been tested on before. I want no part of it. How often has that happened to you where you've got, you know, for those reasons, people that don't want to be vaccinated or don't trust? So, them? so the trust doesn't necessarily refer back to the Tuskegee experiment in the 20s where by uh, treatment for syphilis was withheld from black men doesn't necessarily refer back to Henrietta Lacks where her cervical cancer cells were used for scientific experimentation and great profit to some companies without awareness of the family. No, it comes down to that conversation with the provider and their patient to help uh, allay their fears and also answer questions. And that's why informing them that persons of color have been involved with developing the vaccine. Uh, you should have seen the face of one of my patients when I mentioned Dr. Kismekia Corbett, an African-American woman who's the lead uh, virologist in developing the messenger RNA platform. It was, uh, uh, what? <laughs> what? It, it really not only was surprising, uh, but they were, uh, ha they had a sense of pride of, of knowing that uh, that type of contribution was being made to help save the country. And also the president of Meharry Medical College, a virologist, doc Dr. James Hildreth, was on the FDA Oversight Committee. So uh, informing people of some of those historic and important facts also helped to uh, allay fears. Dr. McDougall, how much onus is on um, the local official officials to ensure that the vaccinations and the vaccinators come to um, you know, lower income populations uh, where we've seen uh, essentially pharmaceutical wastelands. We hear of food wastelands where there aren't big box supermarkets in a lot of urban areas. A lot of times there aren't, you know, big box pharmacies either. Uh, and when we get to the point where, you know, whether it's widespread at CVS or Walgreens or places like that, um, a lot of those places aren't in these communities. How do we make sure that the vaccine comes to the population rather than sort of relying on the population seeking it out? That's a very good point. So the state of Ohio, the Ohio Department of Health is working well in improving in its dissemination, working with local communities. In fact, I was on a town hall Monday speaking to communities of color with clergy leadership, president of the NAACP, president of the Urban League in Cincinnati, and we're reaching out to communities 
and also helping to ensure that vaccine dissemination is equitable. There's also a CDC social vulnerability index that's being used to help identify those communities where such outreach needs to be prioritized. So you bring up a very good point. And that's the question of the day now. And that's what the Biden-Harris administration and Dr. Uh, Mar uh, Marcella uh, Nunez-Smith is focusing on. We've been meeting with her. <laughs> I've been meeting with Dr. Vivek Murthy. So this is a high priority. And as the supply becomes more available, I think we will see much more uh, dissemination within those under-resourced communities. Well, what's crazy, and I know you're going to agree with me on this, is I don't know in our lifetimes if there's ever been another point where every, it has to be equitable. Everyone has to get it. Um, you know, we, we're only as strong as the weakest link. And so just if it's prioritized for the wealthy and in certain communities, and yet you go to different, you know, other parts of your daily life where you're dealing with people who come from other parts of the community and they're not vaccinated, it's still going to affect you. So, you know, clearly we need everyone to be all in. We need this to be more equitable to affect and help you as much as someone else. And until we get that, you know, pounded through people, uh, you know, it's not going to be, uh, we're not going to be in the clear. So let me just finish up as we bring it back to student athletes uh, to the same thing. We have seen this uh, with, you know, just whether or not, you know, teams have been able to stay free of getting COVID. They're only as strong as their weakest link. If someone strays and goes and parties and things like that and brings the virus back, suddenly you have a cluster or an outbreak or so on. So at the student athlete level, how would you advise universities, and you're at one of the biggest in the country, to ensure that the athletes on these campuses are all in to get vaccinated when it's their turn? So with this question, I'm speaking from my role as president of the National Medical Association, not necessarily trying to advise a specific university. That being said, this is a public health crisis, and we know that the vaccine is safe and effective. So uh, with student athletes being leaders on their campuses, I think this falls in line with that student athlete leadership role that they're already playing. And think about how their leadership may encourage other students on campus to also be receptive of receiving the vaccines. So I want to end on a positive note. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, and I know... Uh... You know, doctors are like weathermen. You can never predict exactly what's going to happen here. And then people get mad if it doesn't happen that way. Uh, but uh, if things go as planned, and hopefully they do, by the time we get to the next school year, the next athletic year in the fall, um, what kind of place do you think we'll be in in terms of, you know, competition, potential fans, uh, capacity, and, and that, you know, in, in that aspect from the fall of 21 into the winter of 22? So that's a very good question. And since COVID has been politicized, we may see some areas that do not quite follow through. When one looks at the Kaiser Family Foundation survey on the population, actually there was a fairly high percentage of people who designated themselves as Republican who did not have intentions on receiving the vaccine. Now, that may change. Hopefully that will change when people see how others are doing and in fact are thriving and in fact are being protected against uh, severe illness and disease. And I just bring that in because we have what certain certain communities, certain uh, populations are uh, more receptive to preventive measures, and some are not, even from the standpoint of wearing a mask. So 
maybe a, a better way to answer this question is uh, when we find high adoption of wearing masks and preventive measures that I would think would be a signal of those same communities being receptive to the vaccine. And so we have a lot of work to do in this country. And this is one of our major challenges. And I hope that we can come together, uh, red, white, and blue, to stomp out COVID-19. Well, I'm going to remain optimistic that in the fall, we're going to see that marching band out there at the Ohio State University at the Horseshoe, and someone's going to be dotting that eye, and we're going to have a pretty healthy crowd. I'm going to be optimistic here, all right, <laughs> in Columbus in the fall. Um, Dr. McDougall, I appreciate you. Uh, you're doing unbelievable work uh, for the community, for everyone at large. Uh, and hoping to uh, get on the other side of COVID-19. And that'll wrap up this edition of the NCAA Social Series. Big thank you to Dr. Brian Hainline, our Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Leon McDougall from the Ohio State Wexler Medical Center. As always, you can go to the ncaa.org slash social series, where we have all our social series archived every week. We'll talk again next week. Stay safe, everyone.